Hi, folks. I'm sorry we're a bit late, uh, and um, it's really good to be with, uh, with you. Uh, this is Mike Brassell um, from Red Hat, and I'm joined by uh, Nathaniel McCallum, also from Red Hat. Um, sorry if we have video problems, but as long as you can hear us, that's the most important thing. Uh, Nathaniel, can you hear me? I can hear you fine, Mike. Thank you. That's good. So let's assume that everyone else can hear us. So um, we're going to be talking about running sensitive workloads on untrusted hosts, and specifically about uh, Project Enox. Um, so Enox is an open source project, um, part of the uh, Confidential Computing Consortium, and we'll uh, give you a bit of detail as we go through. But first of all, what is the problem that Enox is trying to solve? Well. It's about the need for confidentiality and integrity. Whatever sector you're in, whether it's banking and finance, telco, HIPAA, whatever, just a standard enterprise, you will have um, sensitive enterprise functions. Um, whether you're deploying in the cloud, on edge, in premise, there are certain things that are sensitive. And when we talk about security um, in, in computing and on the cloud, etc., we tend to talk about isolation. But there are three types of isolation, so I want to go through those uh, briefly now. So um, let's consider that we are on the cloud uh, in this example, and we have a host, which is in red, if you can, you can see uh, the red there. Um, and we also have a tenant, and the tenant has a workload on the host, and there's another workload on the host as well, which is uh, not owned by the tenant. It's owned by, uh, by a different, um, uh, different tenant. So the first type of isolation we call workload from workload isolation. And that is when a malicious or compromised workload is trying to either um, see inside, i.e. break confidentiality, or in fact mess with uh, the, uh, the data or the running execution of another workload. Uh, that's a bad thing, obviously. <laughs> you don't want that happening. Um, luckily, um, this is something which is pretty well known how to deal with. Both VMs and containers have some pretty mature controls, actually, about stopping this happening. So that's, that's, we'll call that type one. Type two is where a, uh, uh, a workload tries to interfere with the host. I, it may be uh, trying to break out, it may be trying to look at uh, memory, maybe trying to, to change memory, but again, this is not a good thing um, because we want to protect the host from, uh, from malicious or compromised workloads. So again, actually, we've got some good news here um, because uh, this, the technology is pretty uh, mature here. Again, we've got things like SE Linux uh, or hardware, uh, VTX controls, whether that's uh, on, on containers or VMs, we're actually pretty good at stopping this most of the time. So that's good. But what about the third type of isolation? Well, that we can call workload from host isolation. This is rather tricky. What we're basically trying to do is stop the host looking inside with, looking inside, sorry, or trying to change the workload. Now, the way that containers and uh, VMs are generally run um, on hosts, this really doesn't work. Um, we don't have controls with existing technology um, that allow us to do this. So what do we do, and why do we care? Well, we talked about protecting sensitive workloads. Let's say you work in a highly regulated uh, or compliance-heavy uh, sector like healthcare, finance, government, enterprise, um, which have specific things like telco, or you're maybe running on a host which is itself vulnerable. Maybe it's out on the edge. Maybe uh, it's somewhere where uh, people can com compromise it. Because if they can get in, they can mess with your workload. This is tricky stuff. And it doesn't matter whether the host is itself malicious or it's been compromised. If if it wants to look inside that workload, it can. Um, there's actually quite a nice uh, picture of the virtualization stack from uh, XKCD about a year old now, um, talking about all the different places things can get compromised. Um, hopefully, we don't see this uh, everywhere. But so, um, Nathaniel, 
Nathaniel, I think it's time to take over the slides, I'm afraid. I've uh, had a power cut here. Are you able to hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, go to the next slide, you think, 14, while I wait for the things to come back up. I don't seem to be able to advance the slides. Oh, I'll talk you oh, There we go. Wait to come back. Um, so, do you want to So I'll, I'll take over since Mike's having difficulty. So one, basically the way that we can try to uh, counter this third avenue for attack, the host to workload attack, is by using a new technology called trusted execution environments. And uh, apparently it's gonna take me very long to, to switch slides here. I click it and it does eventually go, there we go, oh, no. Okay, so basically a trusted execution environment is where we... Mike, are you back? Okay, so a TEE is basically a protected area within a host, and it's important to note that this uh, protection is actually enforced by hardware, uh, not by software. So it does not have uh, the properties that we have uh, when we're using um, software protections in this way. And uh, basically what we want to be able to do is we want to set up a TEE and we want to be able to attest to that TEE uh, cryptographically verifying its contents so that we can deliver things like uh, the workload and the, the sensitive data. And if my slides would advance, A TEE basically provides memory confidentiality, integrity protection, uh, general com compute, and a hardware random number generator. Um, these things base effectively isolate it from the host. Um, one thing to note in particular is that uh, we in the uh, in the NRX project uh, are worried about generalized compute, so uh, things like specialized compute environments are not as interesting to us. Um, so this is our definition of a TEE. And it does take forever for my slides to change. Okay, so how do we know uh, that is a, is a valid TEE is one of the important questions. And this is where we need to do our cryptographic attestation. So we need some kind of measurement on the tenant that proves that the code that's running inside of the TEE is only the uh, exact thing that we want uh, to be inside of that TEE. And we need, uh, th we need this to be able to establish a, uh, an encrypted channel to that TEE. I don't know if technical support can hear me or not, but it takes a very long time for me to switch slides. Nathaniel, please click on the next icon. Right side toolbar of your screen. Um, I don't see a next icon on the right toolbar of my screen. Nathaniel, um, I can help you to click okay. the slide. I'm 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 back I'm back I think so um what slide are we on we're uh, on slide twenty what twenty now twenty yep yeah so the basic idea here is we want to uh, please go back to slide twenty Basically. okay so we need we need to provide an attestation to the tenant uh, that measures the TEE to show exactly what's in it. And then once we do that, we can establish an encrypted channel to the TEE so we can deliver things like code and data under a uh, encrypted channel. So attestation needs to include things like a measurement of the TEE itself. We need some kind of hardware root of trust and we need to be able uh, to do a Diffie-Hellman uh, to, to create a session key with that uh, TEE. So next slide. Sure. So I, I should be able to take over now, I think. So what, we, what, I've, what we've got now is the ability to protect our workload from a, ho a, a host which is malicious or compromised, which is what we were trying to achieve uh, for that isolation, uh, the third type of isolation. So they sound great. However, life's not quite as simple as that. First of all, um, 
there are multiple different uh, implementations of this. The main two at the moment are AMD's SEV and Intel's SGX. Um, there have been announcements from IBM that they're planning to do a different uh, one. But the problem is that each time you design a workload, you're going to have to design it differently and develop it completely differently, and that's not a good thing. And the next thing is that um, for each of these different approaches, um, you're going to have to choose what language you do it in because there are different SDKs um, to support. So are you going to do everything in C, everything in C++, or everything in Java? How does that work? The next thing is attestation. So Nathaniel already mentioned attestation. Attestation is basically uh, checking that the TEE you have is a real one, that it's not someone spoofing. Um, and actually doing that attestation is difficult, um, partly because the, there may be changes, uh, vulnerabilities may be discovered, for instance, in different uh, chipsets, uh, and being able to react to those and make dynamic trust decisions uh, is very complex. The last one is, is related to that in that we've seen already quite a few vulnerability uh, vulnerabilities being reported against, for instance, SGX, and uh, not only them, um, and how do you decide uh, which, uh, where you should deploy your workloads? Is it safe to deploy your set of workloads to a particular generation or a particular version of a chipset? So this isn't perfect. If you just want to deploy workloads, you know, uh, we used to be able to point a, uh, a, a workload at a particular host and just run it using something like OpenShift, Kubernetes, or OpenStack. This isn't easy um, in the current world of TEs. So introducing the Dragon or introducing NARCs. This is the problem that we are trying to solve with NARCs, making TEs usable and, uh, but still maintaining the levels of security uh, that people require. So just a brief overview. First of all, we use TEs for confidential workloads. In fact, we use, uh, we support SCX, or we will be, we'll be supporting SCX and SEV, and looking to support others as they come along. We intend to make it as easy as possible to deploy your workloads, and we've chosen WebAssembly as a runtime. WebAssembly is becoming enormously popular at the moment. We maintain very strong security design principles. We are uh, absolutely intending to be cloud native, uh, and it's open source, of course. This is an open source summit, um, the open source summit, and um, it's currently a, a project, it's not production ready, but it's open source. So uh, I'm going to hand you over to Nathaniel again. Nathaniel, do you want to talk briefly about uh, this slide? <clears throat> sure. Um, thanks, Mike. The uh, key principles here for NRCs are that we don't trust the host owner. I think that should be pretty obvious. Um, the second one is that we don't trust the, the host software because at any point it might be compromised, even if it's very well engineered. Uh, a third point is that uh, we don't trust the host users. Uh, there may be, uh, for example, a rogue admin uh, running on your cloud. Uh, they, they currently have all of this access, but uh, for whatever reason, they want to have access to your data. So we don't want to trust them either. Uh, we also don't generally want to trust the host hardware, uh, although there is obviously a major exception here for the CPU and firmware. Uh, but things like um, we are already, for example, aware in the industry of things like uh, TCP and engine offload attacks, things like that. So we, we don't want to trust that hardware if, if we can avoid trusting it. And so this leads us to uh, the 10 NRX design principles. Uh, the 10 NRC's design principles are that we want to have a minimal trusted computing base. We want to have a minimum number of trust relationships, that is, number of minimum number of parties that we trust. We want to have deployment time portability so that uh, you can take a workload that is prepared for deployment and you can move that from one host to another and it doesn't matter what the CPU is uh, or what the specific hardware technology is. We want that at deployment time. Uh, number four is that we want to ensure that the network stack is outside of the trusted computing base. There is uh, quite a number of vulnerabilities that have come to us historically through the networking stack and we want to avoid those as well. Uh, number five is that we want uh, security at rest, in transit, and in use. So all, all three uh, is what we are aiming for, and we, we think that that is a new bar uh, for a baseline of security. 
Uh, number six, we want auditability. So uh, all of our code, uh, we, we care about it um, significantly when we're doing pull requests and things to make sure that it's auditable. Uh, everything is written in simple, straightforward ways so that uh, it can be audited. And of course, it's all, it's all open source, which is our next principle. Uh, everything we do is open source, so an open source, no exceptions. Um, number eight is that we want to use open standards. So, for example, the interface uh, between the application and the de deployment platform is the open standard uh, WASI, uh, which is used for WebAssembly. So this is a standard. You don't have code to uh, NARC specifically. You can just de deploy existing workloads uh, using existing standards. Um, number nine is memory safety. We care a lot about memory safety, and this eliminates uh, an entire class of attacks. So uh, we uh, chose, of course, WebAssembly here for, for the workload deployment, which uh, gives us very strong memory safety promises. Uh, and then uh, for everything that we are writing in native code, we write in Rust, uh, which also has very strong memory safety promises. And of course, our 10th principle uh, is that we will not support the adoption of backdoors. Um, so we have a commitment not to uh, backdoor the, uh, the NRX platform. And we, we proudly have a, uh, a cross-jurisdiction uh, and cross-country uh, multinational development team. Uh, so uh, we're none of us is beholden to all of the uh, – we don't have everyone beholden to the same jurisdiction, which is a nice position to be in. Yeah. Um, so let's just have a bit of a talk now about the, the runtime architecture. This is a, a somewhat uh, simplified uh, picture of, of the architecture. But it does um, bring out the main thing. So let's look at the bottom for a start. There are two types of uh, trust execution environments. Um, you'll see the word keep there. We use the word keep to describe a trust execution environment with all the runtime and protections that we put in it. So an NRX keep is what you deploy into. So there are two different types. There's a process-based keep, of which keep of which the uh, most well-known is SGX from Intel, um, and there's a VM-based keep, of which the uh, most well-known at the moment is SEV from AMD. Um, and um, above that, we've got some WebAssembly pieces, um, and above that, the application and any language bindings. Uh, what I might do actually is let uh, Nathaniel talk a bit more about the uh, the WebAssembly uh, layers. We already mentioned yep. those uh, W3C standards, but do you want to go into a bit more detail about this? <laughs> yeah, one, one key point, as I emphasized in the previous slide, is that we are using the WebAssembly engine uh, as the target for our payloads and uh, the WebAssembly system interface, WASI, uh, for, uh, for the system interface between WebAssembly and the things that it needs to ask the host to do on its behalf. Uh, it's a really important to note that these are both W3C standards. So as I mentioned before, you don't have to write against ANARCHS. You ha just have to write uh, using your normal language and your normal tooling uh, using the uh, existing WebAssembly uh, tooling that your language provides you, and then you can deploy it with NRX. And there are many, many different languages uh, which you which have uh, a target, a compile target. So you can write in C, C++, Java, Rust, Go, Haskell, Python, and compile your existing uh, application into, into WebAssembly. So uh, let's talk about the, uh, the layer below that as well. I mentioned it a bit, Nathaniel, but do you want to maybe describe some of the differences at the technical level? Yes, besides the WebAssembly engine, the majority of our native code goes into uh, making the specific technologies that we want to abstract across uh, compatible in order to expose this upper layer. So uh, we get things like uh, support for process-based keeps. These are things like uh, Intel's SGX. Uh, RISC-V is also developing a thing called Sanctum, uh, which is uh, similar in how it works. And then uh, on the right-hand side, we have VM-based uh, keeps, things like uh, AMD's uh, SEV, uh, uh, IBM Powers, PEF, and Intel has a technology that they've started to develop. Uh, it currently goes under the name MKTME. And um, these, uh, these technologies, of course, uh, are all rather different under the covers, but we want to be able to make them all expose that W3C uh, standards compliant layer at the top. So uh, that is essentially how the bottom layers work. 
And you can see here basically um, how we how we actually build this up. So our root of trust, of course, is always in the CPU. And uh, above that, we have uh, two major components. The first is the host kernel. And uh, obviously, the host is going to need to have a kernel to run. And um, we also have the NRX provided loader. So this is something that NRX ship. But notice explicitly that it's distrusted. So we, even though we ship our loader, we distrust our own loader. Um, this is because it falls outside of the security boundary that we uh, want to enforce. And so um, so those bottom pieces are, are explicitly outside of our uh, outside of our trust domain. Uh, inside of our trust domain, we have a technology called uh, a shim. And the basic idea of a shim is it's rather different on each uh, each technology. Um, so, for example, it's separate code on SGX and separate code on SEV. But the basic idea of the of the uh, shim is to adapt uh, the specific hardware technology to have a, a common interface for our, our WebAssembly JIT on top. And that's more or less where uh, all of our architecture dependent code lives. Uh, there'll probably be a few exceptions to that, but the uh, ma majority of the platform um, specific stuff will live inside of our shim. Uh, above that, then, of course, we have our WebAssembly JIT, which has a thin uh, interface of WASI on top of it, which is exposed to the application. Uh, it's important to talk about trust. Uh, as I mentioned before, the CPU is trusted. The kernel and the loader is uh, explicitly distrusted. And everything else is trusted uh, via the measurement that the CPU provides us. So we actually get our attestation of, of everything that is above and inside our trust domain. Uh, this is what it looks like, for example, on a process-based keep like SGX. Uh, the next slide is going to show you to what it looks like on a virtual machine stack. And you'll notice that it's actually pretty much the same thing. Um, the only big difference is uh, how the, uh, the loader works. Um, the loader, in the case of... Uh, of SEV is a, a, a um, virtual machine manager. So it, it's a very custom build, very, very small, lightweight one. Um, but uh, that's essentially what does it. And then our shim is, is something like a microkernel, very small, designed for one specific purpose um, and written in Rust. So I think we should probably move on to the demos. Yeah, Mike, do you so want to I'm talk hoping that demos will work. I, uh, we didn't, yeah, I'm, I hope that. Uh, this uh, this will work. Um, so, where are we? Yeah. So this is to remind you what the uh, what the picture looks like, um, and um, this is what we're going to be talking about. So let's we'll look talk first about about SGX. So for the demo, we are not looking at the 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 WASI and the WASM layers, the WebAssembly layers. We're looking solely at the pieces that are required uh, in the actual uh, key. Uh, because this is uh, an early stage uh, proof of concept demo, so um, as we uh, as we move across here, what we want to do is have an application which runs um, in SGX. So let's see if we can uh, we can show a demo. Um, are you seeing this? I don't see anything. I'm not but sure. For for our viewers, uh, all of our demos are available on our website. So you can go to nrx.io and go to the wiki, and the demos will be available there. Um, Mike, are you are you able to get it working? Okay. So I'm I'm hoping I'm hoping you can uh, you can now see this. Uh, no, it's not working. So this is um, should we not should we say far from perfect. Um, okay. So let's let's carry on. I'm very sorry about that. Um, yeah, please so, check out our, please said, check out our website. Things, uh, please check out our website, nx.io. Yep. So, um, that's correct. So um, let's uh, let's carry on. Um, so we basically do the same thing with uh, with SEV, um, and uh, again, we would be showing you a demo, which is sadly uh, not working. Um, can people see the slides at the moment, please? I hope so. I think I cannot see them. Um, um, I, th I think we have so, to move the screen here. Here we go. I've, I've stopped sharing. Perfect. I can see them. Okay, fine. So basically, where we want to be is that we could run the same application on top of both a process-based key and a VM-based key. And in, indeed, that is exactly uh, what we have just done, the same binary. 
Um, and if you'd seen the demos, you'd know that these were uh, screenshots from the demo. Um, and one is on SGX and one is on SEV. Um, and in fact, they're running exactly the same, uh, the same picture there. Um, something weird has just happened to it's my exactly, screen. It's exactly the same uh, static elf binary that is running in both, uh, or rather static pi binary. Um, so what we've what we've done here is we've emulated the Linux syscall ABI layer on top of these two different technologies. Um, this is we consider an internal interface, so we are only going to inter, uh, implement those uh, syscalls, for example, which we absolutely need for the rest of the stack above. Uh, but it does provide a common layer for uh, for us to build upon. Okay, what can you see on the screen? I see the... Uh, Are we seeing the right thing now? I've just received received an M... Uh, I can see uh, the uh, where we are. It's the same... Yeah, the same ELF static pi binary running on top of our shim, basically. And um, as we mature these shims, uh, our plan is to move upwards on the stack and be able to implement... Um, our WebAssembly piece. We, we actually do have a uh, an early implementation of WebAssembly that is running WebAssembly binaries, but it doesn't uh, do it on top of the uh, existing hardware technologies. So it's more a matter of porting existing code um, at this point. So we hope to have a, de a demo on that fairly soon. Fairly soon. So yeah, Indeed. where we would like to so, be next um, is let's talk a bit. Of... Go ahead, Mike. Yes. Yeah, so as I said, this is where we want to be next, which is putting the other bits on top, which is the uh, the workload and the uh, and the and the weapon stack. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the, the wider project because this is not just about the runtime. There are other pieces like the attestation. So here's a fairly simplified uh, picture uh, of what's going on here. So um, it, it, on the left we have the keep, uh, which has the NARC runtime and the application, and that's what we've been talking about. That's all trusted because it sits inside the green colored TE. Um, below that we have the NARC host agent, and um, as um, Nathaniel already mentioned, there are parts of that which are not trusted. Um, so we need to be very careful about making sure there's nothing in there that, that needs to be trusted. On the right-hand side, we have the NRX client agent. So that would normally be addressed by either a CLI or an orchestrator such as OpenShift, Kubernetes, OpenStack. And so what you might do is say, okay, please create a, a keep for me and put this workload in it. So the NRX client agent will talk to the NRX host agent and work with it and the CPU and firmware to create a key. And if that is attested correctly, i.e. if we're convinced it's a real key, um, and we have cryptographic proof that it is, then we encrypt the workload so that it can be sent directly into uh, the key. In other words, at no point is the, uh, your workload or any of the data associated with it in clear on the host or on a network, or in storage. It's always encrypted uh, from the time it leaves the NRX client agent all the way into the NRX runtime. We said we don't trust the host. It's not just that we don't trust the host in the actual execution. We don't trust it even in the loading and provisioning. So there's lots of pieces uh, to be done uh, to be done there, and um, so this is a, a draft, a rather simplified version of some of the bits and pieces that need to be going on there. I won't go into this in detail. Um, this is currently a, a pull request um, on our on our website in Git. I'm talking about you know all the different bits and pieces, and this is in fact simplified. It doesn't talk about uh, some of the uh, protocol. Uh, cryptographic protocol establishment, for instance. So this is the stage we're at at the moment. Um, and do you want to add anything to that, Nathaniel? No, um, just we are moving up the stack. And uh, if you're someone who has um, experience deploying applications uh, and have specific opinions, we'd love to hear from you. Absolutely. So um, last, uh, very near last slide, uh, we've had problems with uh, uh, 
uh, with uh, formatting here, obviously. Um, but we want to make the point we're an open project. We believe very, very strongly in, in openness. The code is open. The wiki is open. The design is open. The issues and PRs are open. So if you have a question, uh, if you want to submit a PR, you can do that. It's all on GitHub. Uh, we have a chat, which is open to everybody. Uh, it's on Rocket Chat, um, NARCs, uh, chat .nrx.io. Um, all of our CI and CD resources uh, can be used. Um, so if you uh, push something as a PR, all the testing and CI CD will happen uh, in the open. That's on Packet.io. And we'd like to thank Packet uh, and Rocket Chat for, uh, for providing us with those resources. We have stand-ups every day uh, of Monday through Friday. Those are open to all. Um, please come along. And we, ha we take diversity very, very seriously. Um, we think we're doing okay. Uh, we have two guys here speaking, but we have a broad diverse team. And we have a contributor a covenant uh, code of conduct, which we take very seriously. So we really welcome anyone who wants to come along. Um, this is our last slide. Uh, we want you, um, please come along. And um, I noticed some, some questions in the, uh, uh, in the Q&A, uh, which I guess it's now time to, uh, to answer, unless you have anything else you want to say, Nathaniel. No, that's it. Uh, thank you all for coming. We, uh, we really appreciate talking about this. We're really excited for the future, so help us come build it. Sure. Um, so uh, a few questions. Someone asked, uh, what is the website? Uh, the website I've answered that was https colon slash slash nrx.io. Uh, we may be moving to nrx.dev at some point, but at the moment you'll find us there uh, on nrx.io. Uh, another uh, great question is, what is the relation with Open Enclave? Some features of NRX, are they competing uh, with Open Enclave? So Open Enclave is uh, another project which is part of the Confidential Com uh, Computing Consortium, which is uh, the Linux Foundation project to encourage use of trusted execution environments in open source. Uh, and it's from Microsoft, and we, uh, we speak uh, frequently to the folks from that project. The other thing is that they take a rather different approach, and we, we expect different use cases um, to be uh, appropriate for NRX uh, and some for Open Enclave. Um, there may be some overlap, but uh, their approach is more of an SDK approach um, rather than a, a runtime approach. So you design your application using that, which gives you different options uh, for how you deploy uh, things and, and how you'd use them. Um, Nathaniel, do you want to add anything about difference with I, Open Enclave? I do. Yeah, I, I think that Open Enclave is a great project. Um, I think Dave uh, is even here, uh, who's uh, one of the uh, people that works on that project, Dave Thaler from Microsoft. Um, it's a great project, and I think that we really are targeting different use cases. Um, in particular, NRX is uh, using TEEs to solve one particular security problem, but we see ourselves as a project that is more than just TEEs. Uh, we really want to provide a... Uh, cohesive environment for deployment of uh, WebAssembly applications into the cloud. Um, and that is a more general problem than the TEE specific problem, um, which, uh, you know, which may have other use cases that we don't intend to target. Um, so uh, I'm quite happy for us to collaborate where we can. And uh, you know, I think both projects are great. So thank you for the question. Yeah, and I, I would add that if you have any uh, questions uh, that you'd like to ask on chat later on, um, Dave is, I think, going to be available, as will Nathaniel and I, certainly I will be, uh, at the CCC, Computational Computer Consortium, uh, chat. If you go to the sponsor hall, and I think we're in the, um, the silver and bronze um, Exhibit Hall B, you'll find the Confidential Computing Consortium. We'd love to see you there, and we're very happy to... Uh, to answer any questions, uh, or to try to answer any questions you have. Um, so there's a, uh, a, a, another good question uh, from uh, Minwei Shi. Um, I hope I pronounced that correctly. I apologize if I haven't. Does NARC implement the, implement the WASM JIT or reuse an existing open source one? Uh, great question. Uh, Nathaniel, talk about WASM time. 
Yeah, so we uh, use the Wasm Time uh, library, which is an existing project that started out life at Mozilla, uh, but uh, Enarx and Red Hat are uh, one of the uh, co-founders of the Bytecode Alliance, which is currently uh, attempting to drive uh, WebAssembly forward as a technology, um, as well as Wasm Time in particular. So uh, the answer is no, we have not re-implemented uh, the Wasm JIT from scratch, and in fact, we are using a, uh, a library that has contributed Contributors from all over the industry, um, not only Mozilla, but also um, you know hardware vendors, silicon vendors, um, and uh, you know many other segments of the industry are contributing to. So um, please check out Wasm Time if you'd like. It's a great project. Yeah, and we hope very soon to uh, to be in a position where you can actually start playing uh, with our with our implementation and, and the, our use of Wasm Time. Uh, Dave Stengler is in, in the chat, and he it reminds me that uh, the Confidential Computing Consortium has just this last few days published a white paper as an introduction to uh, the work of Confidential Computing Consortium and providing some definitions uh, of some of the pieces uh, that are out there. Um, so what else we got? Um, Takanori Suzuki says, uh, Enarx is still not for production. I wish, I wish we're working very hard. If you come and join us, maybe we can make it ready uh, sooner. But uh, un, uh, unavailable yet, we are, we're working hard on that. Um, here's another one from uh, Mingwei Shi. How does Enarx support assistation over the JITID application? Um, yeah. A, a, a very interesting question because it, yeah, we'll go for that. And if I add, yeah. Yep. So, so basically, um, we are working on attestation as having multiple layers. So, the lowest layer of attestation is um, is the NRX runtime itself, which is written in native code and is not jitted. Uh, and this would include the WebAssembly JIT. So, you're going to basically uh, get one measurement for I've lost all. The panel. Of I will continue talking. So, the lowest level is um, uh, the. Can you hear uh, me? The, uh, the runtime itself. We can hear you now. You were just saying that the lowest level is the uh, runtime itself. Yes, the lowest layer is the runtime. We will uh, test that separately from the other individual pieces. And then as you deliver additional layers of code into uh, the keep as it's built up, uh, you will get separate attestations of each of those. So uh, the answer is no, we, we aren't measuring the uh, output from the JIT. We are measuring the input to the JIT. Yes, and uh, of course, one of the one of the key things is that the attestation is being handled by the uh, by the client, by the tenant. So the tenant should not send and will not be allowed to send in Enarx uh, the workload, which is the application, um, until it is happy that the lower levels of attestation have successfully completed, and that completion will also yield. Uh, enough keying data, cryptographic data, to allow the workload itself to be encrypted. So, of course, the client already trusts that the, the workload is correct, that's the application, and then sends it encrypted uh, to run on the already attested um, uh, runtime inside the keep. I hope that answers your question. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions at the moment. We have a few more minutes. If anyone would like uh, to ask any questions, you're very welcome. There's still over 40 people uh, on the call. So um, any questions you have, very, very happy to answer. Um, maybe it would be a good time just to use a couple of minutes out in the fans to talk about some of the types of engineering we're doing at the moment and the sort of people that might be able to help out. Yeah, absolutely. So most of our work up until recently has been focused about. Yeah, um, most of our work up until this point has been uh, focused on low level development of the hardware platform. And uh, we are, however, moving up the stack. So we're currently flushing out our WebAssembly uh, runtime. We're d we are flushing out our network uh, protocol for uh, delivering, uh, for testing and delivering code and data. Um, we uh, have uh, lots of like network protocol work to do. So if that's uh, of interest, we would love to hear from you there. Um, if you're interested in WebAssembly, we'd love to hear from you there. Um, we also um, just have 
uh, general systems engineering uh, work to do. So, uh, for example, we need a keep manager. This is a thing which basically launches uh, each of the individual keeps and keeps track of their life cycle and uh, makes sure uh, that uh, handles all the communication to the tenant. So um, if you're interested in that kind of application work, um, that's great. Uh, we we always willfully in need of people to help write tests, uh, make sure that uh, everything we're doing is formant. Uh, if you're a security engineer, we would love for you to attack us um, or at least review our and tell us all the horrible things we're doing. Uh, we, we always presume we're doing horrible things and, and, and seek to do the best. Um, and uh, yeah, we love um, documentation. If you're uh, you know good at, at, at writing technical documentation, uh, I, I know I would prefer to write code, so you could help me out a lot. Um, uh, we, we would also love, you know, graphic artists to uh, do things like help improve our website um, and, uh, and you know, give us, uh, you know, different types of uh, work there. Um, what else have I missed, Mike? Oh, we need, we need, uh, uh, we need everyone. Uh, we want, we want everyone to be helped. Everyone, yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for your attention, everybody. Uh, it's been great. I'm sorry we had problems at the beginning, and we really appreciate your sticking with it. Um, so we will be available uh, to chat either actually in uh, the, the Red Hat uh, chat, if you can find that, uh, or indeed uh, on the CCC chat. So I'm um, looking forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Goodbye.